Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope that you all are doing well. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I think it's that time of year where, I don't know if it's you, but it's generally this time of year where I generally get tired. And it's not because we have a baby in the house, that'll, I'm sure that helps. Um, it's just that time of year where it sort of feels like you're, you're sort of wishing till the end of the year because sometimes it's at this time where you get to take a long break. Or maybe you're like us and you won't have that long break, but you're still looking for that, I almost want to say that December feel where you, you've reached an end so that you can start January afresh. You just want that, that feeling of something new and you're looking for that sign or that sign. And, and as I was standing there at the back and I was praying and just trying to figure out where God wants to lead this message because I can prepare till I'm blue in the face but at the end of the day if I rely on my preparation and my skill and my knowledge and my whatever then you're all doomed. Sorry to put it so bluntly but good luck. But I believe that if we depend on the Spirit and if we, if we depend on Him leading us in our daily life then we realize that there's hope. Yesterday, as Sophia mentioned, we went to to Jeff's celebration service where they celebrated his life and I'm thankful that in the last couple of months we've been at different churches. We were at that church yesterday but we all were at the Anglican church some time ago when we had the Baptist Unified Church service and it's not something that you generally have the opportunity to, to experience number one in a small town and number two when you're leading a church and I'm thankful for the opportunity because as we start with today's message I'm confronted by this question of where does God want us to go and what type of church does He want us to be? Because personally I feel, and I might be oversimplifying it, I think it is very easy to fill seats. I feel it is very easy to get a great group of people together when you make things fun, when you don't challenge people, when you sort of just go according to what people want instead of what God wants. If there's anything that the Bible teaches us is that very often what we want as people is very often different from God. Which is why I put this, what I believe is a very thought-provoking slide on, just to read it out loud. We often think what we think is true simply because we think it, not because we necessarily thought about it. And the thing is, in life, I believe that this is very often the case. We hear things throughout our life. Maybe it was from our parents or our friends, or maybe a biblical teaching or a book that we read, or this amazing service that we attended once before. The day that we got saved and someone mentioned something, and that just sort of stuck, and you never thought about it. And it changed your life, and it was amazing, but yet it doesn't determine what is right or wrong. And I feel that the one thing that I feel God really wants for this church or this gathering is that we are challenged constantly. Even with this message where I had a preconceived idea of what, what a spiritual gift was or a specific spiritual gift was, in my preparation and in my time with God, God said, okay, listen, it's nice that you think that and that's carried you this far, but now you need to sort of reshift what you think and realize what's the truth. And I'm thankful that God is, if I can sound unhumble, to be humble enough to realize that I make mistakes and to be humble enough to realize that every single day that I need to question what I think. And because I need to do it, I also want to encourage you to do it. Because today we're continuing with the book of, book of Corinthians and I feel like we're speaking about signs and we're speaking about spiritual gifts and I think it's an amazing message that we have today. And some of you are feeling insignificant. Some of you are feeling that life is difficult and that life is hard and you don't know which way to turn and you, and, and you wish that God gave you more or God gave you help and why are we feeling alone? But I want to encourage you with today's message that I feel that this is something that we all need on a daily basis. Now to sort of give recap, and some of you might think I'm tired of the recap, well, I believe that the recap and the context gives so much more color to where we are, because otherwise we don't understand what's going on, and very often that's where false teachings crop in. And people say, yes, but you always hammer on, on false teachings, and you always want to say, but they believe wrong, or they believe this, or they believe that. And I want to remind you what I mentioned two weeks ago. Literally, I think more than a half of the New Testament was written to correct false teaching. The reason why we have a Bible this thick and not this thick is because people kept on thinking what they want to think. They kept on teaching and spreading fake news 2,000 years ago. And it's still the case today because we like to believe what we want to believe. So today I want to encourage you to take all your preconceived ideas 
have them, that's fine, but put them aside and be willing to question what you think and how you perceive life because I feel God wants to set all of us on a wonderful journey today. Now, just as a little bit of context, we're working through the book of Corinthians and I've mentioned that they're a port city, but this doesn't mean much because Port Alfred is also a port city, so why are you saying that it's so sinful? Well, number one, if you look at the map, so if you look, South Africa is around here for those of you who don't really have Richtung. <laughs> we're about there. Now, if you go all the way up, you get about Egypt and all the North African countries around there. But then you get Corinth, right about there. Now, if you zoom into that dot there, the bigger one, not the small one. If you zoom into, because otherwise you're going to be going like this the whole time. But if you zoom into that big dot there, you're going to see that next to Corinth is what they call an Ichmus or an Ishmus or sounds like Gaelic or something. But they have that little, they call it a, a land bridge if you will, to sort of connect this area to that area. And you're saying, Johan, why is that so important? Well, there's one thing that I know from personal experience, people are lazy and people want to get things done quickly. Which meant if people wanted to travel from Turkey or from Albania or something, the easiest route very often would be to go through there, then they'd travel through there, so they would drop their things off there, take it by land to there so that the next boat can take it further. Because remember, it's way back when, safes were not... A, uh, ships were not as safe as the Titanic. So things happen. <laughs> because people didn't want to go around there. Things happen. Okay. So what they did was they went through there, carried it across land and then carried on. Because then I know that I know this section of road. I don't need to think about it. Some of you can drive the, the route from Port Alfred to Grahamstown in 15 minutes and you know every corner, you know every pothole, you know every cow and you can just go around us. The rest of us take an hour and 15 minutes or whatever because we want to make sure I don't hit something, I want to enjoy the view. But time is money. So they wanted to do that. Now, you're saying, well, maybe it was just way back when. Well, this is how they reconstructed now. They created a canal there where boats can pass through to save time. So this is a very important thing. So now this sets context for how many different types of people and things arrived at this village or at this place. So you had this port city of everyone's bad habits centered in one place. We saw it yesterday again. Gabby would not pick up all the nice things from different children. She would immediately see that they're being naughty, that they're running around, or they're touching stuff that they shouldn't touch. It's something in us that we pick up bad habits. We're like when you put a bad fruit and a good fruit next to each other, you will immediately see that this fruit becomes better because of the good fruit. Or is it not? No. The good fruit becomes bad. It becomes rotten because the other fruit is rotten and that spreads. Goodness can spread but it's much easier for rottenness to spread. Now, in the whole book of Corinthians, what has happened thus far is Paul has addressed them and he said, listen, you guys are seeking attention. You guys are seeking who you are. You know, they're looking for that self-esteem because they've got a low self-esteem. But now suddenly they've got hope and suddenly there's a new flavor in town and it's Christianity and it's a year and a half old and people, some people like it, some people hate it. But with, whenever something new happens, I want to be the best thing that in something new because I, I, I saw it from the beginning and this is what was happening here. So people started seeking position and Paul said, remember that you're useless. Remember that in your weakness God called you. He explicitly used the example of how he didn't have PowerPoint and how he didn't have music and he didn't all had all of this when he presented them with the gospel. He tried to remind them that a single person started that whole church and not just the church in Corinth, the church in Ephesus. Because of his influence, the church in Rome started. Because of Paul's influence and Jesus and the rest of the apostles, here we are today in Bathurst which we believe is the center of the universe. Other people disagree. That's beside the point. But we need to remember that the influence a single individual can have. And it's with that mentality that I really want us to start with today's message. With a single person who had conviction, a single person who had a passion for God and just living life according to what he felt in his heart. Everything changed. Never, I think, in Paul's wildest dreams would he imagine that 2,000 years later, people in the bottom part of Africa would be reading his letters that he maybe casually wrote to the church to just sort of correct them in their wrongful ways. We never know the influence that we have with the smallest things. But then Paul carries on with the letter and he ad starts addressing their sin. And he says, remember that you're called for more than this. You're a new creation in Jesus Christ. And, and he corrects them and he answers questions. And then he gets to the point where people start new churches explicitly. Because we like the spiritual 
things. We lack spiritual gifts. The fastest growing church in the world is the charismatic movement, which for those of you who don't know, these are the very happy clappy people. We're, we're happy and we're clappy, but they are very happy clappy. They are very, very ecstatic. And, and some people, some churches, are to such a point, they believe that they are so spirit-filled that whatever happens in life is higher than the biblical word, is higher than scripture, is higher than whatever, because the Holy Spirit is inside me, so He can give me a new truth. But friends, I want to really encourage you that this is not the case. We need to live according to the scripture. We need to follow Jesus' example where He esteemed scripture of old highly and He used this as the benchmark for His ministry because He used that and He said, listen, it was written, it was written, it was written. That was the foundation of all His teaching. And that's what we're trying to do today. But now when Paul starts speaking about spiritual gifts, we have about three chapters that focus on this topic and the first chapter in chapter 12 he starts speaking about this and and he sort of gives this list and then he says but listen at the end of the day just make sure that you follow Jesus and that you that you just remember that all these gifts come from the same spirit it comes from the Holy Spirit and that was his whole emphasis and I didn't put a lot of emphasis on any spiritual gifts and I showed for those of you who weren't here there was a whole list of different texts in the Bible where they have the spiritual list in in 1st Corinthians and they have it in in James and even in Romans they, they list spiritual gifts but my favorite personally is the one in James because it's the easiest to remember the spiritual gifts that sort of can be categorized as if you say something and if you do something simple Let's not overthink it. Let's not make it complicated. Let's not say, but I've got the gift of this healing and the gift of that. Let's just believe that I'm not the one who does it in the first place. And that's sort of where we emph emphasize everything. Because after that, Paul focused on love and he said, you can have all of these gifts till you're blue in the face. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. And then he moves on to the part that we're going to be discussing today. And he focuses a lot on tongues and he focuses a bit on prophecy as well. Now, for those of you who don't know, as a little bit of context, there are churches who believe that tongues are this very supernatural spiritual gift with that empower you. And if you see this cartoon maniki going like this, and when you pray in tongues, then suddenly you're the spiritual God almost. This is how I was presented with tongues the first time. Other people say, no, it, it has ceased. It's not something that we do anymore. Other people say that, well, if you speak in tongues, you're speaking in a foreign language so that you can evangelize. Now today we're going to be having a look just very briefly before we start the message as what does the Bible say? Because my opinion is irrelevant. And I really want to encourage you to always remember that. Johan, your opinion is irrelevant, just like yours. Because what does the Bible say? What does God say? That's where we want to focus. Now in Acts 2, something happened. They, they got these, the, this flame of fire upon them when they received the Holy Spirit. They got this power and then the following happened. When the sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were confounded because each man heard them speaking in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to each other, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own native tongue? Parthians, Medes, the Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and regions of Libya, near Serene, and visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own languages the mighty works of God. So the very first time tongues as a gift was given to the church, what happened? They spoke earthly languages to present the gospel to those around them. But then people said, no, 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 but there's more scripture. And exactly, let's carry on. So in Acts chapter 10, the second time something like this happens, not a lot of detail is given. But then in Acts chapter 11, Paul gives a recollection to the church leaders and he tells them what exactly happened the second time the church received tongues and in chapter 11 verse 15 it says as I began to speak the Holy Spirit fell on them and fell on as he fell on us at the very beginning which meaning the very same thing earthly languages that they used to evangelize and spread the the truth of the Lord then I remember the word of the Lord and how he said John indeed baptized with water, but you shall baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift as He gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to be able to hinder them or to hinder God? And then in Acts chapter 19, it's 
said again that they received the gift of tongues and then they spoke different languages. But they, it, it's, not a, it's not very clear. So it doesn't tell us whether it's an angelic language or this language or, or what it was used for, but it was explicitly showed that they spoke in tongues so that other people could hear and understand. But then people say, no, 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 but wait, it's an angelic language. And we'll get to that, don't worry. But in 1 Corinthians 13, the previous chapter, before we get to today's one, Paul mentioned, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have become as a sounding brass or clanging cymbal. Is Paul saying that the gift of tongues is the language of angels? No. He's saying if. And he's using hyperbole, which is an exaggeration. And saying, no, 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 Johann, it's not. Well, let's continue reading and see how he uses his language here. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and know all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I, have, I am nothing. If I give all my goods to feed the poor and if I give my body to be burned, this being as a sacrifice, showing the exaggeration, and have not love, it profits me nothing. So in my interpretation, according to what I believe, he's saying that the gift of tongues is nothing other than that. I'm not, all I'm saying is I do not believe that he's saying that it is the special language. So let's have a look at chapter 14 where we actually start the text for today to see what Paul says. And he says, follow after love and, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. So it's not a bad thing for us to want spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now what exactly is prophecy? Just want to pause there for a second. What is prophecy? Because if I hear prophecy, I immediately think it's someone who's foretelling the future, someone who's speaking the words of God, and he's this prophet with a big stick and on a mountain, and this is what I see as prophecy. But if I look at what prophecy actually is in the Bible, it's someone who hears God in a revelation and is able to share it. Simple as that. Simple, difficult, and amazing as that. For he who speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to men, but to God. And this is generally where people see, see, you're praying to yourself to God. And I believe that to a sense that that is true. But if I speak German here at the front, who here speaks German? Who am I speaking to? Who's the only one who's able to understand me? God. None of you will be able to understand me. If I stand here at the front and I speak Aramaic, only God will understand me. So he's the only one receiving what I'm saying. For he who speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him, although in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. So he might be speaking wonderful mysteries, but no one is able to understand him. But he who prophesies speaks to men for their edification and for their exaltation and comfort. He who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Now what was the whole emphasis of the book to this point? It's not about me. It's about the church. It's about the people. It's about the common good. I desire that all of you speak in tongues. So it's wonderful. Speak in tongues. But remember, why do we speak in tongues? We speak in tongues so that we can evangelize, so that we can share the message of God. That's why we speak in tongues. But even more that you prophesy. For greater is he who prophesies than he who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edification. I remember the first time I heard about tongues. I was literally sat down by my cell group leader with a whole lot of love and I still respect him to today. But he sat me down in false teaching and he tried to use this text and it got me in tears and he gave me a book and he gave me so much different teachings and it's a wonderful church. Still today, I still love the church. But I cannot deny that there was a false teaching that crept into that church because he sat me down and we read through all of this and they emphasized so much the power of tongues and how we need to do this so that we can be emphasized. So that we can be edified, so that we can be grown, so that we can get stronger. And I'm not saying that this does not happen. But what does the text say? For greater is he who prophesies than he who speaks in tongues. Why would churches literally sit people down and almost force them to try and speak in tongues when the Bible is very clear that we want you to actually prophesy? If you go to a bride and someone says, I really want a nice piece of meat, and you keep on saying, that's nice, but with the meat we'll have a nice little small piece of salad, and some of you love salad, and that's wonderful, and, you can, and, and we're going to have a nice olive in the salad. Now suddenly we're going to start the churches with the olives. This is what they're doing. 
the whole emphasis is on us actually receiving revelation from God and hearing God and being able to share this with people, but yet we're focused on an olive. Now, what does the word edification mean? Because what I, in my Afrikaans ways, I thought edification means I feel good, I feel strong. Like I mentioned, you just, you just feel strong, but that's not exactly what it means. And I realized this morning how God sort of went before me as he always does and he prepared me to get this while I received the word from him at the back where I feel like what type of church do we need to be? We need to be a church that teaches truth above everything else. Because what does edification mean? To edify means to instruct or improve morally or intellectually. I kept on thinking edification meant I'm feeling good. I'm feeling happy. But I think this is what we've made it as a church. We want to feel good. We want to, if you come to church, bless you, you will be good, and then I carry on with life, and life sucks at home. This is not what it's about. It's about equipping all of us to be able to read the scriptures. It's about equipping all of us so that we can read the Bible, so that we can hear God and then spread this message to those around us. This morning, friends of ours are... are guest speakers at a church, if you will, it's at their church, but they're speaking. And this morning, as I was praying for them, I just really in, tried to encourage them by saying, listen, remember, it's not just the people who hear you, it's the people who feel the effect of the people who heard you. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays explicitly for us, me and you, because he says, I pray not only for these, but I pray for these who hear of your word through them. It's an amazing reality if you realize that 2,000 years ago, a day or two before Jesus' crucifixion, he was praying for you and me individually. Why? Because someone took the message and they shared it. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, you keep on worrying about what you're going to do in your prayer closet and I'm going to have spiritual warfare here and chase away every demon. And Paul is saying, you're missing the point. It's about the church and edifying, instructing and improving. We should be better. But carrying on, I'm skipping a few verses to verse 18 because he just sort of re-emphasizes this point and re-emphasizes and re-emphasizes this point. Until Paul gets to the point where he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Why is Paul speaking in tongues more than all of you? Because he's traveling than all, more than all of us. He's spreading the gospel. He's doing something. That's why he got the spiritual gift. Some of us are complaining, why don't I have spiritual gifts? You're not doing anything. I can't give you a car if you're going to stay at home. If it's COVID lockdown, it doesn't help. What, what, what does it help if God gives you the gift of healing, but you never see someone who's sick? We can't pray for all these spiritual gifts and to be an influence in the world if we just are. Oh. We need to do something, then we will be filled with, with gifts. Yet in the church, and now he specifically speaks about the gathering, yet in church, I rather speak five words of understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Sophia and I have been in one or two services where the people spoke a different language. And without that interpreter, it would be horrible. Really, it is a horrible experience because you sit there and you know it's godly, or you hope it's godly, but you're not sure. But without that interpreter, it's just pointless. And that's what Paul is saying. Because people would come from far and wide. Remember, it's this port of people from all over. And you would have Christians from Greece, from Phrygia, from everywhere. And they would attend the service. And then midway through the service, someone would stand up and speak German, proclaiming the things of God. And the rest of the church would just allow him because they think it's godly. But no one has an idea what he's saying. It's pointless. It's chaos. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking, rather be infants in evil. And I think that's such a beautiful picture. Just be children in evil, because every now and again you touch something that you don't, but it's never any major chaos. It's just, don't be experienced in evil. Let's be children in evil. But in your thinking, be mature. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. But even then they will not hear me, says the Lord. So I will translate, I will speak to you from people from all around the world, in all different types of languages, so that you can understand, but people will not hear. As we all know that this is very often the case. So tongues are for a sign, and I want to pause here for a moment. Who here has ever been on holiday? I need some participation. I know all of you are lying if you don't raise your hand. 
Okay. So all of us have at some point or another, whether it been a good holiday or a bad holiday, you have been on a holiday. And generally, at some point or another, all of us have that, that horrible picture where we stand next to a sign, Cape Town. Or we say, we're going to Pufadar. You know, you're standing next to a road sign. For what? Why would we take that picture? But we do. Sophia has 10,000 pictures where she's standing like this next to buildings. It's funny. But she, she did it with every building. Not just the Leaning Tower of Pizza. She has it at, I think, three or four buildings. I think she has one at Big Ben. And, but the thing is, we do it because it's fun and it's wonderful. But do you go home after you saw the sign? No. You carry on to Cape Town. You carry on to wherever you're going. Because you're not looking for the sign, you're looking for the substance, you're looking for the destination. Why are people and churches so emphasized and focused on the sign? Why do we worry about tongues? Why do we worry about prophecy? Why do we worry about all these things? These are things that just direct us to Jesus, the one that saves us. But we're worried about healing, and I want healing, and God, I want to be perfect, and I want the finances, and I want all of this, but all of these things just point us back to Jesus. I can ask the question, whether it's in bad taste or not, that's fine. Who here know, knew how much money Jeff had before he passed? None of us knew. Does it matter? No. He's not taking a single cent with him. Not a single cent. Everything that we want here. How healthy was he before he died? Sort of irrelevant. As far as I know, he was very healthy. He was still cycling. A week before that, he came here and he said, Listen, I want to pray for you as a church because that's the type of person that he was. He was an amazing guy. But everything up to that point, his health, his relationships with other people is irrelevant the moment he steps into heaven. It's irrelevant. The things that keep us awake at night are irrelevant. The moment we die, we're with Jesus. And someone mentioned yesterday, they can imagine Jeff walking into heaven and I can see people being happy to see him. I can see him being happy to be there because finally there's the one I've been speaking about and praying to. But we worry about the signs. We worry about all these fluffy things in between. And I'm not saying that these things aren't important because we're still here and God still blesses us with stuff. The amount of evenings that I've walked from the bedroom to the loo probably overshare, but just stopped and just looked at this house and just been thankful. When I finished building stuff, all of you are so tired of me saying, oh look, I built the table, I built the bride. Because I never thought that I was able to. So I'm thankful. I'm thankful that God blessed me with a talent or stupidity to try things. And every now and again they work. And now every now and again, afterwards I say, yes, this was on purpose. <laughs> All of these things just sort of happened. There was no perfect plan, but now they're functional and they're broken and they work. But God, uh, people, let's try something for God. Let's see how it works and let's put ourselves in a situation where God can give us signs to point to people. And some of you are saying, but I don't have spiritual gifts. Can you do something? Can you talk? Those are the spiritual gifts that James mentioned. You can say something, you could be nice. The nicest thing that we can do is make someone feel included. I've seen it so many times where people walk up to church and they just want to get some spiritual food and someone would, in a moment of trying to be funny, make someone feel bad. I've done it countless times where I've mentioned the wrong thing and I meant nice. But in that moment you just see someone's heart drop because that's not what they were hoping for. Because they were feeling fragile, that's why they were there. But we as people have the opportunity and the privilege to be able to build people up. That's your spiritual gift because God can lead you and He can give you that revelation, that prophecy. That person needs you. He needs a hug. Maybe he needs a drink. Maybe he needs some food. By carrying on. Because we should stop getting stuck on the signs. For tongues... So tongues are for a sign not to believers but to unbelievers. But prophesying does not serve unbelievers, but believers therefore. Therefore, if the whole church assembles in one place and all speak with tongues, and those who are unlearned and believers come in, will they not say, you're all out of your mind? But if all prophesy, because imagine if someone walking in here, we've got ten different languages, someone's standing up and then they speak German and then Afrikaans and then Kosa, 
it's confusing. That's why we speak in English, because it's a unified language that the most people can understand. And those who are unlearned or believers, they will say that you are out of your mind. But if all prophesy and there come one in, does he not believe or the unlearned he is convinced by all and judged by all? Thus the secrets of his hearts are revealed. And so falling down in his face will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Because when we can hear God's truth and we present it to those around us, then suddenly people will see God. How is it then, brothers, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation or interpretation? Who here has been at either a prayer meeting or a church meeting where it just carried on and everyone wants to say something? This is what this is saying. I have a song, I have a word. And this is wonderful, to a point. Because Paul is making it very clear. Let all things be done for the edification, meaning the improvement, the learning, the strength. If anyone speaks in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three. There must be someone who can understand it. Or at most by three, and each one in turn, one at a time, people. And let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him remain silent in church. If no one's going to understand you, be quiet. And let him speak to himself and to God. That's wonderful. Because you're still connecting to God. That's good. But don't disrupt everyone else. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. If anything is revealed to another that sits, sits by, let the first keep silent. For you all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all be encouraged. It's not about me, it's about the group, it's about the individual. I am because we are. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as is in all the churches of the saints. Who here has ever seen a church service either on TV or somewhere else where you've just seen absolute chaos? Now, I'm not judging them, but the word is. And I mean this very respectfully. We need to have chaos. We've been at, at wonderful worship evenings where everything starts off well, and then you have one or two people who just, they're ultra spiritual, where everyone else gets lost. And I think it's a wonderful thing that we can get lost in Christ. But the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Never ever will God take away your free will. Never ever will he make you flap down like a fish without controlling yourself. Because God will rather allow you to go to hell than take away your free will. Now don't tell me this is a thing of God if you can't control your own body. Let that sink in. And I mean it as nicely as I can. God would rather allow you to go to hell because he respects and loves you so much to protect your free will and to let you lose control of yourself. Let your women remain silent in churches, for they are not permitted to speak. They are commanded to be under obedience, as the law also says. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in church. And then people get to this section and eh! <laughs> don't know what to do with this. Number one, I'm just reading what Paul said by a commandment of God, as we'll see in the next slide. But then we also need to, once again, not look, not look at a verse in peace. Because three chapters before, in chapter 11, he spoke about women being prophets, about women sharing, about all of this type of thing. And it's wonderful. It's not a problem with it. But the one thing that Paul makes very clear with the letter that he wrote to Timothy and to Titus, women should not have the teaching authority in a church. It's not my opinion, it's God's. He explains it a lot more clearly to them, and he gives detail about it. If you want more information about it, we can discuss that on a later stage, or in person I could send you the information, I could sit down and we can talk about it, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. But this is not a cultural thing. This is saying we want order, and in this atmosphere, he does not want women to teach in church. Why? Because, once again, as we discussed with the hair, women should have long hair or should be separate. It's not about a head covering, it's about your distinctive roles in church. Which is why, as wise and as wonderful as Sophia is, she'll share, she'll speak in church, but she won't teach other men. Because I don't believe that it is God's will. Do I like it? It's irrelevant. Do I agree with it? It's not my place. It's God's place. And what does Paul do directly after this? After he mentioned this thing that he knows people will kick against because people like kicking against things. He does exactly the same thing as he does in Romans. It's either chapter 9 or 11. And I think it's chapter 11 where he, 
He speaks about predestination and then he realizes that someone's not going to like what just happened now and he immediately says in Romans 10 or in 11, he says, by the way, who are we as the pots to tell the potter why are we as such? So he immediately brought, brings the conversation to a close as he does directly after this. What? Did the, word come, did the word of God come from you or did it come to you? Making it very clear, by the way, who spoke to Jesus? Me or you? Me or you? So he wants to bring this to a close. He's like, listen, you are receiving the word of God. You are receiving instruction from me. So pay attention. If anyone thinks themselves to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge what I am writing to you is a commandment of God. Now, this is not a cultural thing, and I don't like it regardless. What is God saying? But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brothers, eagerly desire to prophesy, and do not forbid the speaking in tongues. It's wonderful, but do it orderly. Let all things be done in decent and in order. Now, friends, we've discussed this amount of theology in a very short time. And I want to stress, regardless of your gift, regardless of your gender, not once did I discuss value. Because our value in Christ is the same. Whether you're standing here at the front, whether you're part of the worship team, whether you're cleaning the parking lot, or just attending today. They don't discuss value because that's not the topic. The topic is spiritual gifts. And what does Paul say the whole time? It's for the church. How can we improve the church? Be kind to someone. We feel insignificant because I'm just one person. Friends, I want to encourage us Two or three weeks ago, I had a message that started with, why are you still here? And the whole purpose was that we still have purpose. Now, you can have all the spiritual gifts, you can have all the finances, all the skills, all those wonderful things. But number one, if you don't have love, it doesn't help. But then why do you have it? It's one thing to know what I want, because I know so many people say, what is my purpose? The question you should rather be asking is, why is your purpose? Why is God giving you this gift? Because some of you know. Some of you know I'm good with people. Some of you know I have lots of money. Some of you know that maybe I'm just average. Well, then be the best average you can be. Just be nice to someone because you're the type of person who won't make someone else feel bad about themselves. Sometimes that's all we need. The best person to receive the gospel from is someone who is not someone who intimidates you. I've spoken to so many pastors or preachers, and Sophia mentioned this before, you have these people who are just unrelatable. They're so full of Jesus that I can't relate to you. I, I, I can't speak to you. I can't share with you that I'm going through a difficult time because you're just such a step up. We need to be relatable as a church. And that's what we're called to do. That's the greatest spiritual gift. Remember, whether we speak or whether we do, just do it for Christ. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you for the spiritual gifts that you give us, Lord. The ones that we know about and the ones that we don't. Help us, let, help us not get stuck on the science, Lord, but help us seek the substance of where we're going. Help us seek you, Lord, in everything. I want to thank you for your love and your passion and this opportunity that we have together, together, Lord. I ask that you please go with us, with us through this week. Help us carry out this message to those around us in a way that isn't intimidating, in a way that is relevant, in a way that respects other people so that we can have order in your life, Lord. I thank you for your love. And I ask that you please guide us closer to you, Lord. Help us hear you and help us be obedient. Amen.